The next significant epidemic is imminent. It is already approaching and has the potential to be even more deadly than the previous one, killing millions more people. We don't yet know with certainty what shape it will take, but global health experts believe that its arrival is not just possible, but probable, that is already abhorrent. The fact that Britain and the rest of the world have done so little to prepare for it thus far makes it much more alarming. We will once more require vaccines to be designed and distributed in record time if we are to successfully tackle disease X, as the World Health Organization ominously refers to it. However, given the current state of affairs, there is no assurance that will occur. While the COVID-19 crisis may seem like a walk in the park now, it was actually nothing like that at the time. Today, it's all too simple to forget that world governments were dangerously unprepared for a worldwide health crisis. In fact, many thought it was the stuff of end-of-the-world literature. Let me give you an example of where we were in May 2020. The situation was incredibly dire. Infections and mortality were steadily rising, and hospitals were on the verge of collapse. The pandemic has more of an impact on the economy than any recession. The only viable option was mass immunization, but there had never been a human coronavirus vaccine authorized, much less one for COVID-19. Even worse, the historical success record for any new vaccines from lab to injection was a terribly sad 10%. The challenge was therefore enormous in scope. Then Health Secretary Matt Hancock called me out of the blue in May and asked me to lead the brand new vaccine task force. In the hopes that at least one vaccine would be successful, I immediately took a leave of absence from my nearly 30-year-old career as a biotech venture investor which deals with the development of novel medications. The task force worked around the clock to prioritize the best candidates early on, to ensure they were safe and effective, to make binding agreements in the face of international competition, and to ensure the vaccines could be produced at scale. This was done while scientists around the world threw themselves into developing potential vaccines at what seemed like warp speed. We all know what transpired a few months later. The task force's two recommended vaccines received regulatory approval. Additionally, the UK launched its immunization plan first in the globe in December 2020. Trust me, None of that was predetermined. We also shouldn't let up now that COVID-19 is largely viewed as a common disease, even though it still has the potential to harm the elderly and vulnerable. It still has the potential to mutate into new versions that are more contagious and even better at avoiding our immune systems, according to scientists. This implies that we may soon have to deal with new viral mutations that are resistant to every antiviral medication and vaccination we've been able to create thus far. But compared to other viral risks, even COVID-19 mutations are insignificant. Let me put it this way. The flu pandemic that swept the world in 1918-19 killed at least 50 million people, more than twice as many as died in World War I. Today, one of the numerous viruses that already exist may cause a similar number of deaths. A virus's main goal is to replicate as frequently and in as many hosts as it can. As a result, they keep evolving and attaching themselves to new animals. In actuality, many of the most lethal viruses, including smallpox, measles, Ebola and HIV, started in animals before becoming extremely contagious among people. More viruses are actively multiplying and evolving today than all other types of life put together. Of course, not all of them are dangerous to people, but a lot of them are. There are now 25 virus families known to science, each of which contains hundreds or thousands of distinct viruses that have the potential to evolve into pandemics. Even worse, they predict that there may be more than a million undiscovered viruses that may potentially move from one species to another, undergo significant mutations and kill millions of people. Why was our shock at the COVID-19 attack in 2020 so great? It wasn't like we were suddenly under attack, like by a huge asteroid or extraterrestrial beings. 
The warning bullets had already been fired, in fact. Because pandemics have been spreading more quickly over the previous few decades, we were aware that COVID, or something like, was most certainly coming sooner rather than later. A pandemic spreads throughout numerous nations and sometimes entire continents, in contrast to an epidemic which is restricted inside a single nation or area. Actually, COVID-19 was the seventh pandemic epidemic since the year 2000. SARS in 2002-2004, H5N1 bird flu in 2004, H1N1 swine flu in 2009, MERS in 2012, Ebola in 2014-16, and Zika in 2015-16 have all come before it. Usually one or more of these factors, poor infectivity, MERS, a relatively low fatality rate, swine flu, or a quick, coordinated multinational response, SARS, kept these outbreaks from wreaking devastation over the world. In other words, a combination of good fortune and careful planning. Despite the fact that COVID-19 resulted in at least 20 million fatalities worldwide, we sort of got lucky with it. The important thing to remember is that the majority of those who contracted the virus recovered. On the other hand, Ebola has a fatality rate of about 67%. At 60%, bird flu is not far behind. Even MERS reached 34%, therefore it is quite unlikely that the next pandemic will be quickly suppressed. Imagine that disease X is as contagious as the measles and has an Ebola-like mortality rate. It's replicating somewhere on the planet, and sooner or later sickness will strike someone. So why are pandemics becoming more prevalent? Well, I can guarantee you that this isn't just a run of poor luck for us. The cost of life in the modern world is shown in the rise in epidemics. First, globalization has made it more connected. Second, a growing number of individuals are congregating in cities where they frequently interact closely with one another. And finally, we annually destroy millions of acres of natural habitat. This factor is particularly significant because approximately three quarters of new infectious illnesses begin in animals before spreading from one species to another and, in some cases, infecting humans. We are fostering these species jumps through deforestation, the use of modern farming practices, and the degradation of wetlands. Why? Because of the drastic loss of habitat, animals are being forced ever closer to other species, including ourselves. It represents a virus ideal world. What should be done then? Importantly, we must start preparing for the next epidemic right away, which means putting money on the table. Software viruses, which the majority of us take extremely seriously, have a lot in common with pandemic viruses. As a result, we spend money on the necessary software and routinely update it on our computers, laptops, phones and tablets. We don't merely wait around in the hope that we won't ever fall prey to a computer virus attack. On the other hand, the majority of us spend a lot to make sure we won't. Global cybersecurity market size was just under $170 billion in 2020. If present growth rates continue, it will reach approximately $370 billion by 2028. That is a staggering sum of money. However, there is very little evidence to suggest that we would be willing to spend even a fraction of that amount to safeguard ourselves against deadly infections. But the financial penalty of doing nothing is enormous. Even COVID-19, a virus that is less dangerous than disease X, left us with a $16 trillion bill for lost output and public health expenses. Because of this, we must find a variety of distinct prototype vaccines for each dangerous virus family we are aware of in advance of the next pandemic. Then we would be ahead of the game because we could design those vaccinations to specifically target the symptoms of disease X. Impossible? In no way. Frameworks had previously been built a decade earlier as part of the failed process to produce vaccines against SARS and MERS, which is why there was such a swift global response to COVID-19. As a result, when COVID-19 appeared, 
Researchers already had a working prototype that could be adjusted to handle the new virus. It was almost miraculous that effective vaccines could be developed in less than a year. However, even that pace wouldn't be enough if the upcoming pandemic turned out to be significantly deadlier than the previous one. A key component of our strategy when I was the vaccine task force's leader was to create a portfolio of various vaccines. In 2020, we had no idea which type of vaccination, if any, would be effective against COVID-19 and its variations, so we decided to use a variety of strategies. We will once more require a portfolio strategy to combat disease X. First of all, because different vaccinations elicit various immunological reactions, leading to various degrees of protection. Second, different nations and areas have vastly different industrial capacities. While some vaccination designs might be better suited for mass production, others might be simpler to make in developing nations. With COVID-19, we observed that using Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna in richer countries and Oxford, AstraZeneca in less developed ones made sense. Third, we must address the inadequacies of the present vaccines, which are not all reliable, portable or affordable. In order to create future vaccines that are more effective and efficient, researchers must be encouraged to test out new technologies and methods. Of course, vaccinations aren't the entire solution. We urgently need to make investments in cutting-edge systems for global viral threat surveillance. If possible, disease X should be eradicated before it begins to spread globally and mutate, which, if unchecked, it will undoubtedly do. We must reconsider our options for what to do in the aftermath of disease X's arrival in Britain and before a reliable vaccination can be implemented. Since we had no prior experience with lockdowns in 2020, it was brutally clear that the policy had been created on the spot. Next time, refrain from using this justification. We need to have prepared our response far more thoroughly and scientifically before it ever reaches Britain. Did it make sense to close schools, long durations of lockdown, a travel ban, recommend that people wear masks? These and other issues are being studied by researchers. However, there shouldn't be any limitations on who may study with the data from the previous pandemic. It should be made accessible to scientists all around the world in a single database. We must continue forward. One of the many tragedies of the 2020 COVID-19 story was that nations frequently fell back into their own silos and refused to support any significant global initiative. It was a terrible failure that claimed numerous lives. We must establish biological vaccine production capabilities in nations from every continent and set up effective training programs if we want to supply vaccinations at a low cost. The nations chosen should ideally have small populations. Why? Since political pressure to vaccinate our own people first, rather than helping those in need, would be less likely. One hopes that the vaccine nationalism of 2020 will be a thing of the past. There is no room for complacency at this point. Governments are aware that the upcoming pandemic could be significantly worse because we have already endured a comparatively non-lethal pandemic. Having a single global body in charge of our response to disease X is the obvious next step. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI, which collaborates closely with the World Health Organization, is the natural candidate to take on the challenge. The truly global CPI was established in Davos in 2017 to create vaccinations against upcoming pandemics. It is now working on a five-year strategy to cut the time it takes to develop a vaccine to 100 days and to build a vaccine library. A worldwide budget for this organization will also need to be funded with contributions based on national wealth. Finally, they ought to all consent to ratify a global pandemic treaty. This would make it possible for researchers and medical professionals to freely exchange information, and it would establish unambiguous accountability 
for the design and production of vaccines. A difficult task? Perhaps, but not inconceivably. The scientific campaign against COVID-19 has been remarkably successful, demonstrating what is possible when we work together. But next time, we must be faster and better.